Link TV, connecting you to the world. Link TV is viewer supported. Watch more at linktv.org. Link TV presents Mosaic World News from the Middle East. Here are today's top stories. Bahrain forces attack protesters returning to Martyrs Square. Child martyr becomes symbol of Syrian uprising and fierce fighting spreads across Yemen. Mosaic, world news from the Middle East, begins now. Syrian opposition activists used the Internet to call for more protests tomorrow to mark what they referred to as the Friday of Children of Freedom to honor the deaths of the nearly 30 children killed in protests. Human rights activists said that this morning the Syrian army shelled the town of Rastan, located in central Syria, with heavy artillery killing at least 15 civilians. In addition, two mosques and a large market were destroyed. The death toll in the past three days of military operations in the area of Rastan has risen to 60, as confirmed by the local consultative committees. The children were not spared from the quelling by the Syrian regime, as cited by the opposition. In response, the opposition has called for the launch of a new wave of protests, dubbed Friday of the Children of Freedom. These images of a student rally were released online by activists saying that the epicenter of the protest was Gautha Street in Homs. According to the local consultative committees, security forces have dispersed the protest and arrested a number of young male and female participants. Similar arrests in Daraa in March sparked nationwide protests demanding freedom and the ouster of the regime. Websites have shown images of children being killed by security forces and the so-called Shabiha. The sources say that some children were tortured to death, such as in the case of Hamza al-Khatib. Since last Saturday, 13-year-old al-Khatib has become the symbol of daily protests across Syria. The protests have not let up, despite promises by the Syrian government to investigate the circumstances surrounding his death, and despite Syrian President Bashar al-Assad's meeting with his father. Human rights organizations said that nearly 30 children have been killed in protests over the past two and a half months. Human rights watch accused the Syrian regime in Daraa of arresting hundreds, including many children, in what it referred to as tragic incidents. But this is not the end. The local consultative committees confirmed that Syrian security forces have shelled the area of Rastan in the central Syrian city of Homs, using heavy artillery, killing dozens of people, including a four-year-old girl. On the other hand, Syrian official sources announced the death of dozens of armed terrorists. The sources also announced the arrests of dozens of terrorists and the seizure of a large cache of weapons, which they say were used to terrorize citizens. The sources added that several members of the armed and security forces were killed and wounded in the confrontations with the terrorist groups. Meanwhile, the Syrian opposition expressed doubt over the seriousness of the regime to implement reforms. According to some human rights groups, the Syrian regime has released hundreds of detainees in light of the general amnesty covering the so-called crimes committed before the end of last month. The opposition said that 10,000 people have been arrested since the spark of the protests calling for democracy. The regime issued a Republican decree to form a national dialogue committee. The committee will help set up the basis for a national dialogue and specify its work mechanism and timetable. These latest measures or concessions were not possible a few months ago, but today Syrian opposition activists say that they are not enough and are outdated. Our BBC correspondent in Yemen reported that gunmen are now waging a street war with government forces and armed fighters of the ruling party in the streets of Taiz, south of Sana'a. 
Authorities completely closed down the city, fearing that thousands of protesters may come from other cities. On the other hand, at dawn this morning, thousands of armed tribal supporters of the anti-regime sheikh Sadiq al-Ahmar gathered at the northern entrances of the capital, Sana'a, in preparation for their entry to support the gunmen clashing with government forces. Yemen is at a crossroads. The opposition, which peacefully demanded the regime to relinquish power at the beginning, has now taken up arms for the first time since protests started. But at the same time, the opposition is calling on the international community to protect it. After the truce negotiation failed, artillery weapons were used in the clashes between the government forces and tribal gunmen in the capital Sana'a, causing dozens of casualties. Forty-five wounded patients arrived at the Science Institute's hospital last night. One patient arrived dead. The street war between government forces and tribal gunmen killed a number of civilians, indicating that the conflict is turning into a civil war, which could drag Yemen into an even wider scale war. The government forces and the Yemeni Republican Guard continue to bomb the locations where tribal leader Sadiq al-Akhmar's forces are entrenching. Sources that defected from the Yemeni army said that thousands of tribal gunmen gathered at the northern entrances of the Yemeni capital Sana'a, preparing to enter the city and support the gunmen engaged in armed clashes against the government forces. <laughs> In the Hasaba neighborhood, they are trying to storm buildings and the residence of Sheikh Sadiq. We condemn them and denounce them from all our hearts as the youth of the peaceful revolution. Sheikh Sadiq is supportive of the revolution, and this regime wants to attack the home of the Sheikh in order to shake us and terrorize us in these squares so that we will leave the squares. But no, we are ever more steadfast and strong. Ahmar supporters said that they are controlling several vital institutions, including the ruling party's headquarters and the Hasaba Police Department. Meanwhile, the Yemeni authorities said that they recovered the government buildings that were taken by Sadiq al-Ahmar's forces. In the southern parts of the country, or more specifically in the city of Taiz, young people of the peaceful revolution who demanded departure of the regime's chief, Ali Abdullah Saleh, clashed with security forces, leading to a number of injuries. Amnesty International described the situation in Yemen as on the verge of complete chaos and warned of a civil war. In Bahrain, dozens of injuries and suffocation cases were reported among demonstrators after Saudi occupation-backed Bahraini forces fired live bullets and tear gas at them. Most Bahraini regions witnessed massive peaceful protests dubbed the return to Martyrs Square. The citizens of Bahrain, the old and the young, men and women, responded to the February 14th Revolution Youth's Coalition call to demonstrate across the country under the banner, the return to Martyr Square, formerly known as Pearl Roundabout. They are also calling for the release of detainees and demanding genuine political reform. Since the beginning of the protests, the authorities used all their might and brutality to suppress these demonstrations at their infancy. And of course, the authorities were assisted by Saudi occupation forces. Bahraini forces were unprecedentedly mobilized in the morning, surrounding areas from which marches were to be launched and imposed a security siege around them. However, these attempts seemed desperate as citizens were adamant on demonstrating and taking to the street despite all obstacles. The residents of Bani Jamra were the first victims, with knowledgeable sources confirming that forces fired live bullets and tear gas at the protesters. In addition, they beat women protesters, leading to the injury of many. <laughs> In Al Malakiye, security forces attack demonstrators with their vehicles, running over one of them amid heavy gunfire. Al Deraz witnessed violent clashes as attack and retreat operations occurred between security forces and demonstrators determined to continue their protests. 
And despite the fact that the wave of protests swept most regions, the authorities seem determined to fight the entire Bahraini people. The regions of Valderaz, Barbar, Al Sanabis, Karbabad, Tubli, Ali, Karana, Karzakan, Damistan, Sitra, Al Sehla, Abu Sabeh, and Bilad Al Qadim witnessed violent clashes and confrontations during which the authorities used all weapons in their possession to oppress their unarmed people. This led to the injury of many. This violent suppression of demonstrations comes as the emergency law was lifted and an invitation sent for what has been called a national dialogue. A dialogue intended to discuss all of the protesters' demands. However, discussing the Prime Minister's post that has been held by the same person for decades crosses a red line. Both chambers of the Shura Council, they cross a red line. And the Constitution also crosses a red line. Protesters say this renders the negotiations meaningless. According to Bahrainis, these invitations and promises are merely additional attempts to deceive the people and gain the support of foreign parties and the suppression of the popular revolution. A massive demonstration was also held in the village of Abu Kuwa, in the Ghusta province, in which participants chanted against the death sentences issued against detained protesters. They demanded their immediate release. NATO continues its airstrikes in Libya. Meanwhile, the opposition's Transitional National Council condemned an attack on a hotel in Benghazi, the stronghold of the revolutionaries. On the other hand, the council expressed its satisfaction with the oil minister's defection from the Gaddafi regime. The Human Rights Council said that its fact-finding mission in Libya concluded that Gaddafi's forces have committed war crimes and crimes against humanity. NATO's warplanes intensively hovered over Tripoli as a number of explosions were heard in central parts of the capital. The coalition announced that it will extend its mission in Libya for three more months. In the Libyan opposition stronghold Benghazi, an explosion occurred near a large hotel frequented by foreigners and opposition members. One person was injured. A police officer quoted the revolutionaries, saying they believe that the bombing may be linked to Gaddafi's agents. The vice chairman of the Transitional National Council said that it is likely that the explosion was caused by a grenade. For its part, the Transitional National Council denounced the attack on the hotel, accusing the Gaddafi regime of being behind it and expressing its determination to bring the attackers to justice. On the ground, NATO's helicopters bombed sites where Gaddafi's battalions are located, in the area between Breka, east of Tripoli, and the Bashar region about 80 kilometers from Breka. In another security development, Fatahi al-Bahaja, a member of the Libyan Transitional Council and official in its political committee, denied the existence of any al-Qaeda members in the region under the council's control. He said that if weapons smuggling occurred, it would be in the western part of the country, under the control of Gaddafi's regime. He affirmed that the Transitional Council is determined to reassure everyone on this matter. The Human Rights Council announced that its fact-finding mission in Libya concluded that Gaddafi's forces committed war crimes and crimes against humanity, while explaining that the mission also obtained evidence that opposition forces have also committed war crimes. In Iraq, the government of the semi-autonomous Kurdistan region has reacted strongly to a critical report by Human Rights Watch. Matt Frazier has taken a closer look. The report by the international NGO Human Rights Watch was entitled Growing Effort to Silence the Media in Iraqi Kurdistan and spoke of death threats, beatings, unlawful imprisonment and questionable lawsuits brought against publications. During the recent anti-government protests in which at least 14 civilians were killed, the demonstrators and opposition groups complained of widespread corruption, nepotism, unemployment and a lack of basic services, despite the massive oil revenue. The regional government issued a detailed response to the report saying they were committed to reform, peace and human rights. The Kurdish authorities must take immediate action to solve all the problems mentioned in the report, including the arrest of those who have shot and killed civilians during the protests. The authorities must punish all those who have committed violations against journalists. 
The government has pointed out that they were elected in fully free and fair elections with a clear majority, and therefore calls for their resignation were undemocratic and potentially destabilizing. The statement also mentioned the two policemen killed in the town of Halabja near Solomonia and dozens of other security personnel wounded by objects thrown by protesters. This report must be taken seriously as Human Rights Watch is an internationally accredited organization. The actions of the government have unfortunately lowered Kurdistan in the world's eyes. We wish to see Kurdistan as a place of freedom. Another international NGO, the Committee to Protect Journalists, also waded in on the controversy, claiming that a culture of impunity reigns in Iraqi Kurdistan, pointing out that not a single person has been convicted of an attack against a journalist, including the torture and murder of the young student and writer Zardasht Osman in May of 2010. However, the Minister of Interior, Karim Sanjari, personally hit back at the motives and alleged unprofessionalism of Human Rights Watch and other organisations, accusing them of believing every story they were told and having a vested interest in exaggerating reports that reflect poorly on the government. The publishing of this report gives the opposition another stick with which to beat the government. And although they will write out this controversy, there is no doubting that their image has been tarnished in international eyes. Matt Fraser, Press TV, Erbil. In other news, fresh fighting has left at least 17 civilians dead in the Somali capital, Mogadishu. Officials say government forces, backed by African Union troops, have clashed with rebels for control of Mogadishu's main market. Many died when stray artillery fire hit a bus station packed with commuters. Another 46 civilians were also injured. More casualties are feared. Somalia has been racked by constant war for more than 20 years now. Its last functioning national government was toppled back in the year 1991. with today's announcement from the Ministry of Defense that Israel's Iron Dome anti-missile defense system has been deployed to the rocket-scarred southern city of Sterot, which has been hit by over 12,000 missiles since the Hamas seizure of Gaza in 2007. We get more on this report from IBA's Aaron Viner. Situated just four kilometers or a mere two miles from the Hamas-controlled Gaza Strip, Sterot has been bombarded by short-range rocket and mortar fire since the Second Intifada more than a decade ago. Production of the Iron Dome interceptor was accelerated after the recent barrage of Palestinian rocket fire in March when the system successfully shot down eight out of nine Katusha missiles fired at two southern Israeli cities. Sterot residents have expressed mixed concern over the capabilities of the Iron Dome. Shopkeeper Rami today told reporters that as much as he hopes the Iron Dome won't become necessary, the system does make him feel safer after having previously experienced rockets exploding overhead. Others argue that the Iron Dome takes at least one minute to deploy and doesn't solve the 15-second problem, the time it takes for Palestinian-fired missiles to reach Sterot. Maybe it will help other cities like Ashkelon, Ashdod and Beersheba, but not us, said Sterot resident Sasson Salah. According to the Ministry of Defense, deployment of the Iron Dome to Sterot will test the lower end capability of the system's spectrum after it has passed field trials for threats with ranges of 4 to 40 kilometers. Israel still falls short of the 10 to 15 additional units it says are necessary to adequately protect the nation's borders with Gaza and Lebanon. Military sources say that the Sterot installation is part of a rotation of Israel's two Iron Domes, while more of the $50 million batteries are manufactured. The U.S. Congress just allocated some $203.8 million for the purchase of four additional units. This is Aaron Viner for IBA News. Twenty-four people, Jews and Arabs, were arrested yesterday during the traditional Jerusalem Day flag procession which saw isolated incidents, instances of racist slogans, fist fights, and stone throwing. IBA's Ellie Wagelander has that story. Tens of thousands of marchers participated in the Jerusalem Day flag march yesterday evening, making their way from the Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood through Jerusalem's old city to the Western Wall. The overwhelming majority of participants were orderly, marching, dancing, and singing songs of Jerusalem. But a few hundred exploited the event, committing acts of hooliganism and violence. Clashes broke out in a number of areas in eastern Jerusalem, and police arrested 24 people, mostly for disturbing the peace. Three people were lightly injured. Face-offs between marchers and pro-Palestinian activists occurred near the tomb of Simon the Just in the Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood. 
Police made a number of arrests there, too. March organizers said that the point of their procession was to show that Jerusalem is united under the Israeli flag. For me, it's a kind of a, a birthday. Uh, that we came back for 44 years ago to this area, and now since then we're just growing and growing and growing. More Jews coming to this area where Jews were living up to 48, and it's uh, like a person that is going up. This is neighborhood is going up from a day from a day, and from a year to a year. Counter protesters said they were there to protect Palestinian rights. I'm here to uh, protect the Palestinians, just to stand with Shejara citizens uh, against this settler march through Shejara, through, the, through their settlements. When they feel like they have a right to be there, and I don't feel they do. The arrests were a minor disturbance in an otherwise joyous event, with some 40,000 people all singing, Bring Joy to Jerusalem and Rejoice Within Her. Ellie Wogelanter, IBA News. Always holding a white carnation and a Cuban cigar, he rejected the sectarian regime since independence. He supported Arabism and resigned from the government. He waged a battle against U.S. projects, deriding those who accused him of being a man of America. My colleague Basil Al-Aridi introduces Saeb Salam as today's figure. There is only one Lebanon and only one Saeb. This slogan is a tribute to a person who excelled in politics just as he was outstanding in entrepreneurship. Saeb Salam refused to be referred to as Beik and instead preferred the word Afandi, considering the former an effect of the British mandate on the Lebanese language. He served as prime minister six times in the era of four presidents between 1952 and 1973. In 1974, he refused to run in the prime minister election during the reign of President Sleiman Frangia, saying, I decline the position because I reject a slave master government. He assumed several ministerial positions, most notably the Minister of the Interior and of Defense. He also represented Beirut in the Lebanese parliament in about 10 rounds of elections. He took part in the meetings that led to the Ta'if agreement. Salam was famous for his moderation and his call for a consensus between Muslims and Christians. He was the first Muslim to deliver a speech at St. Joseph University. He exerted efforts against the sectarian regime since the National Manifesto of 1943. He also strongly opposed the use of weapons in the Revolution of 1958. He was known for wearing a white hat, which brought him closer to the people, according to those who knew him. His Cuban cigar distanced him from Fouad Shahab. He was known for his absolute rejection of intelligence authorities, especially the Second Division. A journalist who accompanied him to many political events described him as a brave Lebanese man beyond the imagination of his enemies and an Arab that transcended diplomatic negotiations. He was a devout Muslim with a good report with the people. In 1956, he resigned from the ministry due to the trilateral aggression on Egypt and Lebanon's ambiguous position on the issue. He left the ministry to lead the opposition against the Eisenhower Project and the Baghdad Alliance. During the reign of President Kamil Shamoum, he formed the National Union Front to counter the incorporation of Lebanon into the trilateral alliance. He became close with Gamal Abdul Nasser, opposed Kamil Shamoum, and aligned with Fuad Shahab. He had a dispute with Suleiman Frangia and submitted his resignation as prime minister minister because Frangia did not expel the army commander, General Iskandar Ghanem, who was responsible for allowing the Israeli commandos into the Barda area in the capital, Beirut, in 1973. The War of 1975 was a major turning point for Saab Salam, who disagreed with Kamal Jumblat, Yasser Arafat, and the Lebanese national movement. He was closer to Pierre Jumail and his Falange alliance than to Jumblat. At the same time, he was not on good terms with Damascus. وكان أقرب إلى بيير جميل وطروح كتائب منه إلى طروح جملات ولم يكن في الوقت نفسه Upon returning from exile in Switzerland, arranged by Rafiq al-Hariri, he retired from politics and attempted to reconcile with the capital of the Umayyads, Damascus. However, Damascus boycotted him after accusing him of playing a major role in the signing of the May 17th agreement. During the Lebanese civil war, he was the first to propose the slogan, no winner, no loser, only dialogue and understanding, in pursuit of restoring national unity. 
Salam joined different sides and formed various alliances in Cairo, Damascus, and Riyadh. He reached out to Baghdad, Washington, and Paris, and joined a popular movement without any partisan affiliation. He spent his near century-long life defending his popular principles. His home in Beirut was a meeting place for Lebanese rivals. During an interview with an American university, he said that he did not form a party to boost his own reputation. Beirut is a very dear name to me. I'm proud to call myself an original Beirut man. Saab Salam was a man of the country of roses, whose name is linked to the capital, Beirut. Under his reign, Beirut was known for its spirit of Arabism, the expansion of Nasser ideology, and the theory of open Arab borders. He felt with the Palestinian people and supported their cause. He said that Lebanese Muslims support the Palestinian guerrilla fighters because of their Arab sentiment for reclaiming the robbed lands. The carnation flower faded, and its owner passed away, but the residents of Beirut still miss the voice of Arabism disdained by other prime ministers. The views expressed on Mosaic are from contributing broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible by grants from the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, the Firedall Foundation, and by support of viewers like you. Thank you. Watch Mosaic World News online. Stay up to date with breaking news, read our blog, get transcripts of past shows and more at linktv.org slash mosaic. This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non commercial use only. Link TV is the only U.S. network dedicated to global and national news, uncompromising documentaries, and diverse cultural programs, programs which connect you to the world.